Member for London West. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, in recognition of Mental Illness Awareness Week, I'm pleased to rise as MPP for London West to highlight the important work of the London Middlesex Suicide Prevention Council. The focus of this week is to raise awareness and reduce stigma around mental health through the sharing of personal stories, which is exactly what the London Middlesex Suicide Prevention Council seeks to do with its Lifting the Silence Memorial Walk and Ceremony held this year on September 10th. This annual event, now in its 13th year, is organized by volunteers to remember those lost to suicide and to support the family and friends they left behind, individuals who have lost a loved one or experienced the stigma associated with suicide share stories, poetry and song and are invited to honour their loved one by name. This year, the names of more than 75 individuals were remembered, including Jennifer Watt, who died by suicide in 2015 at the age of 20 and whose story of being forced to sleep on the floor of the ER was raised by me in this legislature. Speaker, mental health services in London are struggling to serve more individuals and more families with fewer resources. The gaps in service can be particularly devastating for children and youth. Events such as Lifting the Silence reinforce the desperate need for more services in my community and the harm that this government's $330 million cut to mental health funding will cause. Thank you, Speaker. The member for Toronto Centre on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome uh, a few guests that have joined us uh, here in the members' gallery today. I'd like to welcome Eleanor McGrath and Wendy Pitblato, who are two activists that have been instrumental uh, in. A, in uh, a achieving a plaque commemorating the home children uh, in Toronto for all of the tremendous work that they have done. And I'd also like to welcome Camille Begin with the Toronto Heritage Foundation, uh, who is also instrumental in that plaque, which I'll be speaking to in my member's statement. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. Member for Thornhill. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I just want to let everybody know that for over 40 years, RENA has served individuals with autism and other developmental disabilities, and the RENA Foundation is hosting its third Exceptional Abilities Gala November 21st at the Fontana Primavera in Vaughan, and Premier Doug Ford is the scheduled honoree. The gala celebrates exceptional abilities of the individuals in the developmental services sector. Rena and the 2018 chairs David Bodenstein, Madeline Bodenstein, and Jeffrey Shankman are grateful to Premier Ford for stepping up as the honoree. Proceeds will be directed to support vital programs and to launch the capital campaign for a new building in Thornhill. The building will be modelled after the Rena community residence that opened in 2009 and has become a model for the sector. The new building will provide new affordable housing for this sector, which has a current wait list of over 6,000 people. President and CEO Brian Keshen has formed a consortium of agencies across Ontario who wish to build similar buildings, and RENA is at the forefront of lending its expertise to other agencies. I'm pleased to lend my support to Sheila Miller Lampert, the executive director of Adv advising for the gala, and we went to high school together, Western Laval High School together, Sheila has also co-chaired the same gala two years ago with um, Doug Ford, and uh, Chief Mark Saunders was the honoree. I attended with my husband. It was a fantastic evening, and I'm sure that this year will be fantastic as well. And I want to thank the sponsors, the donors, the participants, the organizers, and the chairs, and I especially want to thank the special guest of honour for the event, our very own Premier Doug Ford. Thank you. Member Statements, the member of Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. I rise today to acknowledge a painful memory in our shared history here in Ontario. Our province has a deep and sometimes heartbreaking story, and it's important that we tell all of our stories, not just the ones that are easy to hear. Last week, I had the honour of attending a plaque unveiling at Metro Hall commemorating children from Great Britain and Ireland who were sent to Canada from 1869 well through the 1940s as labourers and indentured servants. These children were often mistreated and abused. They have become known as the home children, and it's their story that I rise to tell today. These orphaned and impoverished children came to Canada at very young ages and were often separated from their siblings. When they arrived, they were sent to receiving homes where they waited to be placed in households that would provide them with housing in exchange for their labour. 
One of uh, those receiving houses was located on Jarvis Street in my riding of Toronto Centre. It's estimated that approximately 10 per cent of all Canadians are descendants of the home children. And it was an honour to stand with the descendants of the home children, with Heritage Toronto, and with community activists who fought to share this story for all of us. I look forward to seeing this in plaque installed in its rightful place on Jarvis Street, at the original site of where the receiving house was located. Speaker, as I wrap up, I'd like to call on all of the members of this House to learn from our history and to beg of us to learn from our mistakes. We've seen the generation, generational harm that it causes to remove children from their families, and this is a trauma that we still see continue today through our CAS system. Mm -hmm. Lastly, Speaker, uh, I've been given a pin to commemorate uh, the home children, and I would like to request the unanimous consent of this House to wear it today. Thank you. The member for Toronto Centre is seeking the unanimous consent of the House to wear a pin to recognize the home children. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Member statements. The member for Sault Ste. Marie. I wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize and speak a little about one of the groups that has joined us here today at Queen's Park, and that is the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association. As I'm sure many of you may be aware, prior to my time as uh, an MPP, I was actually a lawyer in, uh, back at home in my city of Sault Ste. Marie, practicing in both criminal and civil litigation. Started off as an in house duty counsel uh, at the courthouse, moved on to be an assistant Crown attorney. Uh, then went into defense practice and uh, have just about sat on every side as a lawyer uh, of the law that we have. And um, throughout that time, I developed and continue to foster such a tremendous amount of respect for all those people who work within the uh, legal profession and those who contribute so much to help and support the rule of law and access to justice in the province. The Ontario Trial uh, Lawyers Association are such a group. Formed in 1991, this association has done incredible work both within Ontario and across the rest of Canada and the United States. Not only are they champions in advocating against injustices within our society, but they work to uphold the standards and professionalism that all lawyers, past and present, myself included, should strive to achieve. From one lawyer to another, and on behalf of the Attorney General of the Province of Ontario, I want to once again welcome Rom Bohm, Alan Winperl, Laura Hillier, John Carapita and all the other members from the association that may have been missed today at Queen's Park. The work that you do is so invaluable, and I wish you continued success in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Member Statements. The member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. This week, Premier Ford has decided to ramp up his attack on working Ontarians. He said with great animosity that he was getting rid of Bill 148. Speaker, more people are working since the minimum wage went up not less. There is no evidence to support the Premier's position. His fear-mongering does not help people. It only helps their bosses take money out of the workers' pockets. In Alberta, the minimum wage rose to $15 an hour this week. In Seattle, where the minimum wage is $15.45, they have recorded a historic low in unemployment rate. Even big businesses like Amazon have finally admitted that they can afford to pay workers $15 an hour. Meanwhile, here in Ontario, we are moving backwards. We are going downhill, and we are going fast. The Ford government, who hands out public money to corporations, the bi big business buddies of the Premier, claim that the benefits will trickle down. Everyone knows that the way to boost the economy is from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. Minimum wage workers don't typically get to jet ski in Muskoka. 100% <laughs> of their wages go back into the economy. This government repeatedly says that their best program to lift a person out of poverty is a job, and yet they want to keep millions of Ontarians, those who have a job, those who are working in poverty. Sure. No one should be working full-time, let alone two or three or four jobs, and still live in poverty. No one should force themselves to work when they are sick. No one should lose their job because they uh, have an emergency. No one deserves to have their pay, paid vacation days cut. Speaker, Ontarians deserve so much better. They deserve respect, and they deserve dignity from this government. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm honoured to rise today during Mental Health Awareness Week to thank one of the strongest advocates for action on mental health issues I've ever met. Earlier today, I attended a press conference hosted by the member from Nickel Belt, where one of my constituents, Noah Irvine, age 19, challenged every member in this House to put partisanship aside 
and to address the lack of action on mental health and addictions issues. My constituency of Guelph has seen a 50 per cent increase in the number of emergency room admissions for mental health and addictions issues. Across Ontario, we've seen a 54 per cent increase in emergency department visits for children and youth seeking um, mental health services. Right now, over 12,000 children in Ontario are on a wait list for mental health services. NOAA challenged everyone in this House to support the recommendations of the Select Committee on Mental Health and Addictions. Eight years after that committee's recommendations, Mr. Speaker, it is time for us to act. NOAA's campaign reminds us that it's urgent to build a comprehensive and fully funded mental health strategy for Ontario, and I want to sincerely thank Noah Irvine for his advocacy on behalf of everyone struggling with mental health and addictions issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Perth, Wellington. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in this place today to reflect on and celebrate our farmer families and the entire agricultural sector in Ontario. This week marks the 20th anniversary of Ontario Agriculture Week. 20 years ago, MPP stood in this place and debated a private member's bill tabled by the member from Perth, Mr. Bert Johnson, who is in, in the gallery here today. Bert's goal was to set aside a specific time each year for all citizens of Ontario to celebrate the hard work of Ontario farmers, farm families, and agriculture workers. It begins each year on the Monday immediately before Thanksgiving. At Thanksgiving, the harvest is nearing completion, and we can see the full bounty of what Ontario has to offer the world. During this time of year, agricultural producers across Ontario are working long hours to ensure the province and world has enough food to last the winter. Ontario's agri-food industry is extremely diverse and includes a great number of people who would not define themselves as farmers. Agriculture Week recognizes not just farm families, but the diverse businesses and food processors in our province. It celebrates their many contributions to Ontario as they, as they deserve special recognition for providing all Ontarians with healthy, nutritious food. 20 years ago, the agriculture industry in Ontario represented $25 billion in GDP annually. Today, Mr. Speaker, it brings in over $40 billion. Wow. Here, 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 here. Please here. join me in thanking Burke for his leadership and commitment to agriculture in the province of Ontario. Here, here, here. And once again, we welcome Bert Johnson to the Ontario Legislature this afternoon as well. It's great to have you here. Member Statements, the member for Thunder Bay, Atacokan. Thank you, Speaker. Today in my riding, the Injured Workers Group is hosting a workshop on dealing with WSIB and the trauma that many people who are who have been broken by their work suffer. I worked for 25 years representing people with WSIB claims and systems. I have witnessed the various changes that WSIB has manifested itself with. The costly consequences of prime real estate acquisitions, name changes, and programs that never seem to work sufficiently to meet the mandate or in help injured workers. From 2010 to 2015, there's been a 25 per cent reduction in compensation for lost wages, 10 per cent reduction in health care costs paid, and a 66 per cent reduction in payment for permanent impairment, Shame. leaving thousands in poverty. This government celebrated with a 30 per cent reduction in premiums to employers when WSAB retired their unsecured debt. I know employers, especially small businesses, have suffered too. But we must examine the cost of, to us all when benefits continue to be denied. When WSIB fails to live up to its responsibilities, a system supported by employer premiums and WSIB investments, the burden falls on Ontario taxpayers. I encourage members of this House to read the publication Workers' Comp is a Right by the Injured, Ontario Injured Workers Association. Thank you. Member Statements, the member for Oakville North Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. 
Recently, I was pleased to be able to tour one of the gems of Ontario's health care system, the Carpenter Hospice in Burlington. Carpenter is a palliative care centre with trained staff under the leadership of Executive Director Karen Candy and more than 200 volunteers providing care and comfort to its residents and therapeutic outreach programs to the wider community. Their residential care is designed to enhance the individual's quality of life, attending to emotional, social and spiritual needs, as well as physical health care. I want to thank Rick Firth, President and CEO of Hospice Palliative Care Ontario, for conducting the tour. Mr. Firth and his organization represent the hospice sector, which now has 342 beds in 40 residential hospices across Ontario, similar to Carpenter, caring for over 6,000 people each year. The Auditor General in 2014 reported that these hospices save the health care system $24 million annually over the cost of hospital care. I want to thank Carpenter Hospice and all of the staff, volunteers and families in the hospice network for the high-quality work they do. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements? The member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I would like to recognize the start of the 2018-2019 National Hockey League season by honouring the first Indigenous player to play in the NHL, Henry Buddy Maracle. Buddy Maracle was born on September 8, 1904 in Ayr, Ontario. He played in 11 regular season games and four playoff games with the New York Rangers. Maracle made his NHL debut on February 12, 1931 in Detroit versus the Detroit Falcons, now known as the Detroit Red Wings. He scored his first goal and added an assist and two penalties against the Philadelphia Quakers in the historic Madison Square Garden on February 22, 1931. I was honoured to take part in the ceremonial unveiling of his jersey in my riding last week. The event was well attended, with dignitaries such as the Mayor of North Dumfries, Susan Foxton, Chief Ava Hill, Mohawk Wolf Clan, um, the Chief of the 56th Elected Council of the Six Nations of the Grand River, as well as Nancy and Christine, who are relatives of Buddy. I'd also like to thank Irene schmidt Adeny of the Air News. Irene's research over the last few years has brought attention to Buddy's place in hockey history, as well as in Canadian history. Their next goal is to have Buddy officially recognized by the Hockey Hall of Fame as the NHL's first ever Indigenous player. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone that helped organize this successful event. Buddy Maracle will undoubtedly be an inspiration to future hockey hopefuls from air. Mr. Speaker, with two-time Stanley Cup winner Kyle Clifford and Henry Buddy Maracle both hailing from air, it's very clear that air is a good old hockey town. Thank you. Thank you very much. That concludes our time for members' statements this afternoon.